The Dr. Phil Show now continues with another exclusive interview. Ted Bundy is one of America's most infamous serial killers, dubbed the Lady Killer. One of the most famous psychopaths in Utah's history is Ted Bundy. The serial rapist and murderer was captured and caught here. The good-looking, charismatic Bundy admitted to killing at least 30 women. But some say he could have committed a hundred or more during his reign of terror. A judge in Miami today followed the jury's recommendation and sentenced Theodore Bundy to die in the electric chair for the murder of two co-eds. It is hereby imposed the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. But there was one secret victim, one who got away, one who has never told her story until now. Rhonda Stapley was a young, innocent college student when she accepted a ride from a handsome stranger. When she got into his old Volkswagen, she had no idea she was sitting next to America's most notorious serial killer and was about to look death right in the face. Nobody in the world has ever heard your story before. Tell me how you encountered Ted Bundy. It was October of 1974. I was a, a pharmacy student at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I was at a city park waiting for a bus to take me back up to campus. The bus was late. I was getting frustrated. And then this tan Volkswagen drove by very slowly. Cute driver kind of looked at me as he went past and then he stopped and backed up and leaned over and rolled down the passenger window and asked me where I was going. I told him I was going up to the U and he said, me too, hop in. So I opened the door and got in. The first thing that I noticed was the inside passenger door handle was missing, and he leaned over and pulled the door shut, but I wasn't alarmed. I figured college kid, college car, things fall off. How does he look to you at the time? He looked like a college student. He was dressed nice, had a green pullover, sweater on, nice slacks. And you say, okay, because he looks like the fabric of the university community. He didn't look like an outsider. He didn't look like we would think about a predator. Right. So you drive off, and what was his demeanor? Lighthearted. We just had the normal conversation that strangers would have. I told him, my name's Rhonda, and I'm a pharmacy student. What are you studying? He told me his name was Ted, and he was a law student. In a, just a couple of blocks, he turned a way that wasn't the normal route to the university. And I asked him about that, and he was very polite and asked my permission if it would be all right if he took a little detour. He told me he had to run an errand up by the zoo, and I told him that would be fine. I didn't care. I thought I would still be home faster than if I had waited for the bus. And then we went right on past the zoo, and I said, hey, I thought we were taking me to the zoo. And he said, no. I said, near the zoo. That road goes over the hill and drops down into Parley's Canyon, which is the main highway back into the city. Nothing's gone off in your head yet? Nothing's gone off. We're just having fun. We get to the bottom of that canyon, and we should have turned right to go towards campus. And instead, he turned left and started driving up another canyon. And as he's driving, he's kind of looking at parking places and side roads. The conversation started to go weird then because he stopped talking to me. And I'm still trying to make idle conversation. And, and I'm thinking that he's probably looking for a place to pull off and park and wants to make out. And, I don't know him and I'm not really a makeout person, but he's still a cute law student and I don't want to offend him and I don't want to embarrass myself. So I'm thinking of how do I get out of this situation? And then he pulled into a parking place and, and parked the car and turned it off. So at this point you think, I'm gonna have to fend off a romantic advance. Yes. And then he turned in the car seat so he's kind of facing me and he leaned in really close I thought he was going to kiss me. Instead, he said very quietly, do you know what? I'm going to kill you. And he put his hands on my throat and started squeezing. My first thought was, it has to be some kind of a joke. This guy's got a weirdest sense of humor. But that was just maybe a fraction of a second because I realized he was squeezing too tightly. He was serious and I was in trouble. And there's no door handle. What did you do? We had a little small battle in the car, but I went unconscious. So he choked you to the point of unconsciousness? Yes. Did you put up 
a fight? I did as much of a fight as you can put up when you're running out of air. Did you think at that point... I'm gonna die. You think I'm dying in this Volkswagen bug right here? I thought I was gonna die right there in the car, but he had other, other plans. Coming up. He said, good girl, good girl. Don't die on me yet, because you would miss the best part. We now return to Handsome, Charming, and Deadly. I escaped serial killer Ted Bundy. In the tapes made available this weekend, Bundy tells of a murder and describes himself in the third person. He placed his hands around her throat, just to throttle her into unconsciousness so that she wouldn't scream anymore. We're back at this spot where this horrible thing happened 40 years ago. Coming back feels kind of creepy. I didn't really remember the sound of the water until we came back here. I remember it clearly now. There was a picnic table in this area. The Volkswagen was parked in that area over there. Then he turned off the lights. We were sitting in the car at the time. He strangled me unconscious. I thought I'm gonna die. I am really gonna die. So I just came to on the picnic table. So you go unconscious. You wake up on a picnic table. Are you near the car? Probably about 30 feet away from the car. Okay. Do you know how much time has transpired? I don't. I woke up, he was slapping my face like they do on the movies when they're wanting to wake somebody up from being drunk or something. Mm -hmm. And then he pulled me off the picnic table and was slugging me in the stomach. I was doubled over on the ground, begging him to stop. Were you screaming and crying? Yes, and, and begging for my life. I was uh, telling him, don't, don't hit me anymore, you know. And he's hitting you in the stomach? I'm losing my breath, I'm almost throwing up. I'm worrying that ribs are breaking and stuff, possibly. Okay, and so now you're on the ground. Now I'm on the ground. And he sat on me, on my stomach and chest, mashing me so that there's no air. And I said, get off, I can't, can't breathe. And he said, you have to relax. And if you stop struggling, I'll let you breathe. And so I held still for a minute, and he did let me breathe a little bit, kind of scooted back on me so he wasn't smashing me so much. And then he um, put his hand over my nose and mouth and cut off my air. And I passed out again, and he sort of enjoyed just watching me die. He would do that over and over. At one point, he asked me, how would I prefer to be strangled? How would I prefer to suffocate? Would you prefer it like this? And he put his hand over my nose and mouth again. Or is it better for you like this? And he put his hands on my throat again. I just thought I was gonna die. And how many times do you think he took you to unconsciousness and, and then brought you back? Probably at least five, maybe six. Really? And did you get the sense that he knew how far to go without killing you? Yeah, I think it was a game. And then what happened? The last time as I was coming from unconsciousness to consciousness lying on the picnic table, he was slapping my face again, trying to wake me up again. And he said, good girl, good girl, you don't want to die yet. Don't die on me yet, because you would miss the best part. And he grabbed me by my boots at the end of the picnic table, pulled my pants down and raped me. And just as that was finishing, he leaned forward again and put his hands around my throat and was choking me again, and at that point, I, I, I didn't struggle. I decided I was dead. I was just gonna wait until it was over. When he raped you, was he quiet? Was he talking? He was, he was silent. All I remember is his eyes were just black and evil. The next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground, and I was sort of surprised when I came to again. And it's pitch dark, and he was standing by the open door fiddling with something in the back seat, like 30 feet away from me. And I didn't really plan anything like a great escape, but adrenaline was running and I just jumped and ran. I didn't run very far because my pants were in a wad around my ankles. I tripped after just one or two steps, but fortunately or luckily or intervention from above or something, I fell into a fast moving mountain river that swept me away from my attacker and probably saved my life. Coming up. How far did you fall before you hit the water? Six feet. Face first? Yeah, I'm feeling like I'm drowning. 
I was being smashed into big boulders, tree limbs, and I thought that I was still going to die. We now return to Handsome, Charming, and Deadly, a Dr. Phil exclusive. Ted Bundy is one of the world's most famous and studied serial killers. He was a kidnapper, a sadistic serial rapist, a torturer, a murderer, and it's the way he went about those murders that is so disturbing. He probably strangled me to unconsciousness five or six different times. The last time I woke up, I was on the picnic table. I came to and you can see a little light coming from the dome light of the car. He was probably looking for the crowbar to make sure I was dead. I just thought, run. I was still lightheaded from being unconscious. I didn't notice that I was running towards a river and a cliff instead of towards a forest. And the next thing I knew, I was landing in ice cold, stop your heart cold water, which was sweeping me away from my attacker and probably saved my life. At the same time, I thought, I'm still going to die. I encountered one of the most serious serial killers, and I lived to tell about it. How far did you fall before you hit the water? I think it's probably about six feet. I kind of scooted, slid down the embankment and landed. Face first? Yeah. This is October, right? It's got to be cold. It, it was like stop your heart coldness water. Just all of a sudden, I'm in the water. And I'm, I'm not feeling safe yet. I'm feeling like I'm drowning. I was being smashed into big boulders, tree limbs, and forced under bushes and stuff by the force of the water. I thought that I was still going to die. You ultimately stopped against a grate, right? Some yeah, type of some kind of a metal grate to catch tree limbs and debris going down the river. How did you get out of the river? I climbed out with the use of the debris as kind of a little stepping stone. Your pants are still around your feet. Still around my feet. And yeah. so you get your clothes back on as best you can. Do you have any shoes on? Yes, I was wearing brand new hiking boots that day and wrapped the laces around my ankle about three times and double knotted them. And that's probably why that he couldn't get them off and neither did the river. Now you've climbed out of the river. Do you have any idea where you are? I know that I'm about four miles up the canyon. So I followed the river and just walked out of the canyon. I was terrified. I thought he would find me and if he did, he would stab me or choke me or run over me or... You thought if you got on the road, he would come driving by? He would, yeah, that's and, what I And find you. So you stayed... So I stayed right along the riverbank. God, I'm proud of you. God bless you. Okay, so you get back to civilization. Where did you get to ultimately? I walked all night to my apartment on the university campus. You walked a hell of a long way. Yes. After being horrifically brutalized. Were you still worried he would find you? Yeah, I was ducking behind trees and whenever any kind of car would turn toward me, my heart rate would go up and I would just know I was gonna die. Is it still dark when you get home? It's starting to get light. When I got to the bottom of campus, kind of on my turf, and I'm feeling more empowered and more anger than fear at that point. So you go to your apartment. Where are your things? I had a backpack uh, with my driver's license and student ID, stuff like that. And the backpack I had left probably still in the Volkswagen. He had your name? Had my name. He could have found me if he had wanted to. So you make it back to your apartment. What did you do? Showered, got out of those clothes and bathed, drained the water and bathed again. And then I slept, I was exhausted. You wake up later that day. Thinking I gotta, I've gotta do damage control. I gotta get my river ruined clothes off the bathroom floor and I've gotta put on long sleeve shirts and I've gotta cover my bruises because I don't want anybody to know that this has happened. Tell me, what's your 21 year old mind telling you that you have to hide this? I'm feeling shamed. I'm embarrassed. I feel stupid for having even gotten myself into such a dangerous situation. I should have known better. I thought that if my mother found out, she'd make me drop out of school and go home. I imagine people pointing at me and saying, that's that girl that was raped. How did this sit with you across time living with us alone? I, I hadn't dealt with my own, my own emotional pain. And then the news was reporting that other people were missing it. They were finding bodies up the canyon. And every time that happened, I was feeling guilt about all those other women. That if I had come forward, maybe he would have been captured. I had all this nervous energy right after that. I was total insomniac, so I would put on my clothes and go running in the middle of the night. Do you know why you did that? 
I think I was trying to run away from myself and try to run away from remembering. It's just a, a way of coping. As people value their lives less, we tend to see them engage in high-risk behaviors more. Yes. It's like, yeah, I guess I could get killed, but... What could they do to me that hasn't already been done? How did you feel when he was arrested? Coming up. When I saw him on TV, that's when I knew that he was my bad guy. And I knew their monster was my monster. We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview, I Escaped Serial Killer Ted Bundy. Pensacola, Florida police are questioning a man they say may be one of the worst sex murderers of all time. He has been positively identified as prison escapee Theodore Bundy, a suspect in the rape murder cases of at least 36 young women in California, Washington, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, and Michigan. How did you feel when he was arrested? When I saw him on TV, and then I knew his real name was Ted, that's when I knew that he was my bad guy, and, and I knew their monster was my monster. You know why he didn't lie about his name. Because you weren't intended to leave that... Parking lot. Didn't matter that you knew his name. Mm -hmm. What do you see when you look at that face now? What a waste. His whole life was about hurting people and causing pain and suffering. And he looked so normal. When you got married, and started a family. I mean, what did you say to yourself? Well, I thought that it wouldn't really be possible. But then I met my husband. I told him that I had been raped. He said it didn't matter, and he didn't ask for details, and I didn't offer any. He accepted me for who I was. You made a beautiful bride. Thank you. <laughs> we had two daughters together, lots and lots of pets. I had a career as a pharmacist. Um, life was good. Tell me about the process you went through in deciding to write this book. What happened is I developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And I started having flashbacks and memories and panic attacks and nightmares. And being a victim is a very lonely feeling because you feel like you can't really tell people. And nobody would really understand because nobody has experienced what you have. How dark did this get for you in the aftermath? Very dark. The darkest was probably when I realized that all those other people may have lived if I had come forward, I realize now through therapy I don't need to feel guilty about that because he was Ted Bundy and he would have killed people whether they were the Utah people or, or not. How bad did the guilt get for you? I self-medicated. Uh, at one point you overdosed. Yes, right after his escape, his first escape. Was it intentional? Yes. I don't know if I really wanted to die or if I just wanted to stop the pain. If you could talk to 21-year-old Rhonda, knowing what you know now, what would you say to her then? If you could talk to 21-year-old Rhonda, what would you say to her then? It's not your fault, Rhonda. And you are the same person that you were before. Um, you're not damaged and you didn't ask for it. Um, you're not stupid. She deserved better than she got in that parking lot and she deserved better than she got in the years that followed. True? True. And you're still here. I am. I know that if we suffer in silence, then it just becomes penalty. But if we create meaning to our suffering, then it becomes tuition. We get something out of it. And there are thousands upon thousands of 21-year-old Rondas, and they're hearing you now. Maybe it gives them the strength to report something and keep someone else from falling victim. That's why I said I'm so glad that you're here and so glad that you've written this book, and I want everybody to read this book. Rhonda, thank you for telling your story. Thank you. 
I want to thank both Heather Danishevsky and Rhonda Stapley for sharing their stories today. It takes real bravery to come forward and talk about things that perhaps are easier to leave buried. All women should use these stories as teaching tools to keep themselves safe. It's about trusting your gut instinct and hopefully by hearing these stories, that gut instinct will be razor sharp. Rhonda's book is called, I Survived Ted Bundy, The Attack, Escape, and PTSD That Changed My Life. Her book comes out in May.